Ari Bol, Pranam to you all. Welcome to explore the land of faith together. Today we will continue discussing uh, the question, what does faith look like? Um, and, and talk about Saranagati's surrender as the outer expression of faith. I will begin by reciting some prayers as a blessing for our meeting today. And uh, you are welcome to join them. Om Makyana Timiranda Syakyananjana Salakaya Saksurun Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Kurave Namaham Vansakal Patarupya Sakripa Sindhupya Evatsa Patitanam Bana Vepyo Vaisnavepyo Namo Namaha Vande Sri Krishna Chaitanya Nityananda Sahodito Kododae Puspavanto Chitro Sando Tamonudo Vande Ham Sri Ramakrishna Apaya Saranastako Sukado Paramanando Sundaro Supalapriyo So today we have arrived uh, at the last two characteristics of Saranagati or surrender. So we are focusing on giving oneself completely to God and humility. Today is also the disappearance day of Srila Narottamadas Thakur. So, um, so I will say a few words about his life as well. Giving oneself completely to God and humility, they fit actually well together. Giving oneself completely to God is a characteristic of Saranagati, but it is also one of the nine limbs uh, of Pakti. Um, like if we go through the list, uh, hearing, chanting, remembering, serving the lotus feet of the Lord, worshiping the deity, praying, serving, becoming a friend, becoming a friend and uh, completely surrender, surrendering ourselves. Uh, so completely surrendering ourselves uh, is the last, last word on the list. And it sounds like very high ideal, like, like not, not something that everyone is able to make, make it just like that. Siamananda Prabhu made a really nice point uh, about uh, this uh, in one of his talks a couple of weeks ago. He described how Srila Sridhar Maharaj uh, turned the list upside down. He said that Atmani Vedanam, completely surrendering ourselves, uh, needs to come first. Because only in that way, we really practice the other limbs of Pakti. First, you have to offer yourself and then you can engage in kirtana, deity worship, and so on. And similarly, Bhakti Vinoda Thakura uh, turned the arrangement uh, of qualities of Saranagati kind of uh, upside down. He started with humility and put rejecting what is unfavorable to Bhakti, unfavorable to growth of love uh, last in his list. As human beings, uh, we see and perceive the world in a bit different ways. Like some of us learn first the details, and then little by little, a big picture starts appearing when you combine all the details. And others usually like to start by catching a big picture and then add, add, add all those little details, little by little there. So there are different ways of, of approaching new things. And, uh, and it's not like one is right and one is wrong. They are just different ways. However, um, often it is easier to find inspiration if we know why we are doing something. There's a story about two stonemasons who, <clears throat> who were working with big stones and making them fit for a stone wall. A passerby asked the first mason, what are you doing? 
the mason was looking a bit angry and tired. He was cursing and swiping um, and wiping sweat off uh, his forehead. And he snapped out his answer. Well, what do you think I'm doing? I'm hacking and shaping rocks. Can't you see? Just get lost. The other stonemason was doing the same thing, whistling and smiling. And when the passerby asked the same question, what are you doing? Um, <clears throat> the answer was, I am building the most beautiful cathedral in the world. So in the same way, if we keep our focus on our ideal, we kind of automatically turn ourselves towards it. Like a flower looks for the sun and turns to face the light and warmth that is coming down from there. If we are able to find a connection to ideals like surrender, giving ourselves completely and humility, even on a theoretical level, it will help us in our spiritual practice and in life in general. We start seeing how we can learn from anything that is around us, nature, and everyone whom we will meet will become our teacher about surrender, about giving ourselves to God. And in the same way, the uh, humble attitude will carry us. And uh, our practice is not uh, anymore motivated so much by different, I should do this kind of lists. Uh, Humility is emphasized in practically all world religions, and perhaps mystic um, contemplative traditions uh, have especially pointed out the importance of humility in relation to spiritual growth. Humility allows us to embrace the compassion of God. It allows us to receive the gift of faith, the seed of unconditional love that starts to grow. Thomas Merton, a Christian monk, has written, humility contains in itself the answer to all the great problems of the life of the soul. It is the only key to, to faith with which the spiritual life begins, for faith and humility are inseparable. In perfect humility, all selfishness disappears. So starting the path of uh, devotion requires some humility. We talked in our first talk about three aspects uh, of faith that Christian church father, St. Augustine was talking and writing about around 1600 years ago. So firstly, faith that there is more in this world, more to this world than what we can see what we can experience with our senses and measure with our intelligence and uh, our finest tools. Secondly, faith in revelation, believing what God is saying to us through our scriptures and our teachers. And thirdly, faith as developing a personal, meaningful relationship with God. So faith requires humility. It requires humility, humility to admit that I can't control everything. I don't even know myself, not to speak of the other things in this world. Or the real knowledge, the knowledge worth of knowing that, for example, Bhagavad Gita is all about. It requires humility to approach a teacher and ask for help. I can't do this on my own. I don't understand these things. Please help me. And uh, like we discussed in, uh, in our second talk on, of this series, we start our spiritual path with blessing from our guru, our guardian. And from them, then we learn the method of spiritual practice. We learn what is favorable, and uh, what is unfavorable for chanting. And following the instructions of our teachers, we are able to pro progress despite of uh, anarthas, despite of false values and thought patterns that are obstructing our growth. 
Submission to Guru requires humility. And such humility, it fosters bhakti, and bhakti fosters humility. So it's a cycle of support that helps us to move forward. My Guru Maharaj's Bhakti Vedanta Tripurari Swami points out in his book, Shikshastakam of Sri Chaitanya, that there are two kinds of humility described in this beautiful poem, which was spoken by Kaurahari Krishna Chaitanya himself. In the second verse of, of uh, Shikshastakam, Krishna Chaitanya is saying, so many names you have manifested and in them invested all your power. There is no, rule, no hour, no rule to recall them. O Bhagavan, your mercy is so great. But, she, but just see my faith, my misfortune. For your name, I have no attraction. So here, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is lamenting his unfortunate condition. And uh, at, the same time, see, at the same time, his heart swells up with humility. We as Sadhakas practitioners can have this as our example. Like we talked um, in our second talk of this series, the second verse of Shikshastakam is connected with stages of um, Bhajana Kriya, spiritual practice, and Anartha Nivriti, cessation of obstacles on the path. Sincere humility attracts the empathy and compassion of Krishna. And that compassion gradually cleanses our, cleans our heart and we come steady in our faith and in, pra in our practice. The third verse of Shikshastakam says, being humble like a blade of grass, being more tolerant than a tree, expecting no admiration, yet showing others veneration, one should glorify, glorify Hari constantly. So here Krishna Chaitanya is describing the kind of namakirtana by which the real unconditional love awakens. And chanting the names of God will gradually qualify us to chant with these symptoms at the stage of, at the stage of nishta, firm faith. And after that, our chanting carries us forward towards prema, the true love. We learned from the second verse that humility will attract God and we, he will stay in the form of his name, names with us, despite of our false values and uh, despite of the offenses we are still committing. My Guru, uh, uh, my Guru Maharaj points out that this kind of humility arises from mind when we come to contact with compassion of the Lord and we notice how resistant we are towards it. He also notes that humility, which is described here in the third, third verse, however, comes from the soul. Humility arising from the soul is a natural byproduct of spiritual advancement and it starts to manifest itself at the stage of Nista firm faith. Tripura Swami writes, I quote, in Nistha Pajana Kriya, the finite soul approaches the door to the infinite. Above the door, a sign reads, Kirtaniya Sada Hari, always chant the name of Hari. And the doormat to this threshold says, Sunichena, be humble. At this junction between time and eternity, the finite and infinite, a natural humility arises as what it actually means to be finite is glimpsed for the first time. Today is the disappearance day of Sri Ramarathama Das Thakura. And uh, we know him mostly through his beautiful songs, like for example, Sri Guru Charana Padma and uh, Sri Rupa Manjaripada. And he also has an interesting life that itself tells us so much about humility and giving yourself completely to God. Sri Narottama Das Thakura was born in the middle of the 15th century as a son for a king and a queen. 
Krishnananda Datta and Narayani Devi. It is told that even as a young boy, Srila Narottama Das Thakura was very good at school and his teachers were astonished uh, by his capacity to learn. When Narottama was 12 years old, he had a dream in which Nityananda Prabhu told him to bathe in the Badmavati river. The experience uh, in the dream was so strong that uh, Narottama indeed did so. And uh, it is told that it is told that uh, as soon as he put uh, his foot in the water, the river started to overflow. There's a story in Premavilas about Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu passing through that area sometime before that. He was dancing and uh, then he suddenly started to call out the name Narottama. Nityananda Prabhu asked him, why? Why are you calling this name? Why are you calling Narottama? And Mahaprabhu replied, my dear Nityananda, you don't know, you certainly don't know the glories, your own glories. When we went to Jagannath Puri, you said tears of divine love day after day. I managed to capture your divine love and save it. Now I wish to keep it here by the Padmavati river for Narottama Das. He asked the river to take his love and keep it safe until Narottama comes. The river asked, how will I recognize him? And Krishna Chaitanya answered, you will know it's Narottama. When he enters your waters, you will overflow. And now Narottama has arrived, a 12 year old boy was entering Padmavati river because of the dream he had. And the river gave him the biggest present anyone can ever have, Krishna Prema, the true un unconditional love of God. Sometimes when I hear this story, I'm wondering, didn't uh, the Padmavati river have any temptation to hold on to that precious thing and uh, keep it to herself? I guess you could always come up with some kind of uh, explanation and uh, excuse. Oh, I haven't noticed Narottama stopping by. Oh, there have been some floods and some overflows, but uh, I haven't been really able to keep track of all of them, like what, what caused them. <laughs> or, or, well, Narottama stopped by, but he was in such a hurry that uh, I didn't manage to give it to him, but I I'll do it next time. I guess that that's often the logic with uh, material things. The more you hold on to them, the more they capture our mind. We start fearing that uh, someone might steal them, someone might steal or break them, and then we get more and more attached to them. But with the love of God, it's quite the opposite way. The nature of that nature of that love is to grow and to overflow. And uh, when we arrive at the stage where we really are experiencing love that is full and ever increasing at the same time, we can't help but give it to others. And the more we give, the more we have. And again, we give more and we have more. It's like the unending circle of love. And that's how, that's how um, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's contemporaries we were able to see through his disguise, Sri Krishna, the thief of the hearts, had stolen Srimati Radharani's love in order to experience it and uh, taste it fully. So he took it and hid in the darkest corner that he could ever think of. But the nature of love is to come out and to shine. And when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu noticed that, he started it giving it away so that he wouldn't be caught of his thievery. And we know what then happened. The love just increased. Like Srila Sridhar Maharaj has uh, written in a poetic way about golden volcano of divine love. But anyway, let's get back to uh, Narottamadas Thakur.
So he received Krishna Prema, and uh, after some while he ran away from his home and left his royal life as prince. He had seen Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his dream, and uh, Sri Chaitanya advised him to go to Vrindavan, where he would receive initiation from Lokanath Goswami. However, there was a small problem. Lokanath Goswami was drawn to worshipping the Lord in solitude. So he had made a vow not to take any disciples. So here we have Narottama, young and eager to approach his future guru. And we have Lokanath Goswami, who has made a vow not to have any disciples. And it's not like any vow or any promise. It's a vow that you make before God in order to serve them better. So how is this going to work out? Who will win? There are, there are a bit different versions to this story. But anyway, uh, Lokanath Goswami refused to take Narottama as his disciple. But Narottama wasn't discouraged. He tried to figure out how he could serve Lokanath Goswami even from a distance. So he decided to clean the place that Lokanath Goswami was using as his toilet. And in addition to cleaning the place, uh, he would leave fine earth and uh, fresh water so that Lokanath Goswami could clean his hands. I don't know how long it took from uh, Lokanath Goswami to notice what was going on. When you, are, when you are really absorbed in your bhajan, in your spiritual practice, or, or I guess when you are really, really uh, absorbed in, in anything, <laughs> you don't always um, notice so well what is going on around you. And cleaning as a service is often something that we notice only when it's not done. So uh, people who are doing the cleaning work in this world, they are often like these invisible angels that do extremely important work that most of the time goes unnoticed. But at some, time, at some point, Lokanath Goswami became curious. Who is cleaning around here every single night? So in one of the evenings, he hit him, himself in the jungle. He was chanting his chaba and uh, waiting to see who was coming to clean the place. And we, when he found out that uh, it was Narottama, he told him to stop. Narottama, however, fell at Lokanata's feet and began to cry. His humility and service attitude touched Lokanata's heart. So he broke his vow and gave Narottama initiation. It is a great lesson of humility that we can learn here. We are often warned about the false pride, pratista, that is the root cause for all of our obstacles uh, at the spiritual path. But there's also a lot of false humility that can prevent us from uh, progressing. When Lokanatta Goswami first refused to accept Narottama as his student, Narottama could have reacted like, well, the guru has spoken. I can't do anything but just go away. I'm so humble that I can't resist him. I, I'm so fallen that, uh, that uh, I, I couldn't make him to broke his vow. And, uh, and of course, I guess in a way, Narottama did this. Uh, he didn't start to argue or make a camp right at the place where Lokanath Goswami was living. He found a more discreet way of serving him in a truly humble state of mind, not expecting anything from him, but, we, but, uh, but he was willing to give him uh, and make his life a little bit easier. And that kind of surrender and humility caught Lokanath Goswami's attention. Humility is not an easy lesson to learn. In many Gaudiya songs and prayers, our saints, uh, they speak with great humility. 
they see the greatness of God, God's compassion and love. And they truly understand how small they are in the role of a sadhaka in relation to that and how greatly indebted they are, how dependent they are of God and God's compassion. And when we listen and sing these songs, uh, there's a great temptation to do the same. Sometimes we are almost competing with each other about who is the lowest and uh, most incapable of doing anything. Pakti Pranaya Padmanabha Maharaj often refers to this story about Srila Prabhupada and uh, his student who introduced himself to Srila Prabhupada as the lowest and most fallen of all of his students. And Srila Prabhupada replied, you are not the most of anything. And that's the point. Uh, often we are concentrating on looking at our own finger instead of seeing the moon to which it is pointing. Often we are so concerned with ourselves and the misery of our own that we are losing the sight of our ideal. We get tangled in our own shortcomings instead of remembering the, the compassionate nature of God. Pakti Devi and our teachers. It's not humility if we are bathing in our own shortcomings. We can learn from them, that's for sure. And, uh, and that's already a sign of humility. Trying, failing, trying again, failing again. But at the same time, having our eyes fixed to the sun and uh, moon. Like we prayed in the beginning of uh, this talk, I offer my respectful obeisances unto Sri Krishna Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, who are like the sun and, the, and moon. They have arisen simultaneously on the horizon of Goda to dissipate the darkness of ignorance and thus wonderfully bestow benediction upon all. They are our compassionate friends reaching out for us and inviting us to Krishna Lila. Our practice of Saranagati, like we talked last week, it's, it's also always connected with our goal and our ideal, the overflowing love of God. And in the same way, our humility is connected with uh, our spiritual growth and ideals. Thomas Merton has said, humble people can do great things with uncommon perfection because they are no longer concerned about their own interests and their own reputation. And therefore, they no longer need to waste their effort in defending them. So here we can see how closely connected these two characteristics uh, of Saranagati that we are talking today are. Uh, humility and giving oneself completely to God, the more we are able to surrender, the less we think about ourselves. And the more we grow in humility, the more we are able to surrender. Humility doesn't mean that we are minimizing ourselves. And uh, sometimes we really need to step forward and speak up. If we see that someone is bullied, or uh, if we see that someone is left alone or being pushed outside of the community, if we notice that someone is treated unfairly, and if we are not able to do anything ourselves, we can point out the situation for other people who perhaps uh, have better chance of doing something about it. I have, to, I have often heard the advice uh, that we should be ready to defend others, but if we are, are ourselves treated badly, we should just humbly accept it. That, that's also a common um, ideal among the spiritual traditions. Like, for example, in Christianity, hey, they have the ideal of turning the other cheek. Um, and, and, and yes, in a way, um, 
I guess we can say that that is our ideal. It doesn't have, it doesn't matter what happens to us if we only are able to praise the names of God. It doesn't matter how the world treats us if we only are able to stay absorbed in the overflowing divine love. But to be honest, hand on the heart, how many of us really are on that level where we are focusing completely on our service, on our spiritual practice and on the love of God? How many of us really are so firm and steady in our faith that we never get distracted and never lose the sight of our ideal? So as long as the humility is coming from our mind instead of coming from the soul, we need to use our intelligence to analyze different situations and our personal reactions. If there are things in our life that are making us unhappy, it's a good idea to think about them for a while. If we, if we feel that there's a problem with uh, how other people treat us, uh, we can, again, stop for a while and ask, what can I learn from this situation? What can I learn from this person? There's a saying, uh, and that's actually written by Khalil Kipran, whose poem Siamananda Prabhu cited a week ago. So Kipran writes, I have learned silence from the talkative, toleration from the intolerant, and kindness, kindness from the unkind. Yet, strangely, I am ungrateful to those teachers. So, so we can learn something from everyone and uh, every situation. And then if we notice that we are not really able to learn anything because we feel so offended, so hurt, we can admit those feelings to ourselves and to others as well. We can tell others that we are not happy with the way how they are treating us. We can tell them how, how we would like to be treated. And after we have done that, uh, we have all the reason to believe that others will respect the lines that uh, we draw in order to take care of ourselves, uh, our own well-being, and uh, in some cases, even about the tiny creeper of love that is slowly growing in us. If feelings of anger, bitterness, or feeling neglected grow too big, they can certainly harm the growth of love in us. And if that's the case, then it's better to talk about them and try to fix them somehow. Of course, we don't have control over other people's behavior. They might hear us and uh, sincerely try behaving differently. They might not be interested at all about what we are saying. But whatever happens, uh, we can have a peace of mind knowing that we have done our part and shared our point of view. Thomas Merton has said, pride makes us artificial and humility makes us real. Humility is the surest sign of strength. In Gaudiya tradition, our strength comes from God, it comes from our teachers, and it comes from our friends. For us, humility, it's always in relation to God and in relation to growth of faith and love. The idea is, uh, I want to look at the world and life through this ideal, through this window of, of uh, opportunity, that has been opened to me by my teachers. I want to see others and myself in the light of this ideal, concentrating on the potential that is there in each one of us. Sometimes I succeed better and sometimes I fail, but I try again. I want to grow in humility, faith and love. And that's the attitude with which we are approaching our practice our friends, our teachers, and God. And that brings us back to Narottamada's Thakura's life. 
with his surrender, service attitude uh, and humility, he was able to convince uh, Lokanat Kosvami to accept him uh, as a disciple. He received mantras from Lokanat Kosvami and later Narottama studied the scriptures under Siva Kosvami and he got the title Thakur from uh, Siva Kosvami. And this reminds us nicely how there can be more than one important teacher in our life. We might receive mantras from a certain teacher and uh, receive uh, the seed of love from her or him. And then it might be another teacher under whom we are studying the tradition more closely. Lokanat Kosvami gave three orders to Narottama Das Thakur. He was ordered to establish the deity worship of uh, both Gaura and Krishna. Uh, the second order was to serve the Vaishnavas, and then third, uh, thirdly to preach the congregational chanting of the holy names. And Narottama Das Thakura dedicated himself to carrying out these orders. One of the, one of um, Narottama Das Thakura's main preaching points was that the decree of devotion should only be measured by one surrender and realization. There should be no consideration of uh, birth, age, caste, or social background, and so on. And, um, and also he pointed out the, that the advancement on the path of uh, love is not depending on your social standing or like role. It, like, like whether you are a householder or sannyasi, it is um, simply about what, it is simply about how well you are able to give yourself completely to the Lord and to be absorbed in their service. Uh, and um, this was quite revolutionary teaching, not only in Narottama Das Thakura's teaching, but uh, in, uh, in the teaching of uh, Sri Chaitanya and uh, his contemporaries. Um, um, it's, it is something that we, as uh, later offspring of uh, great Sri Chaitanya tree, are eternally grateful for that, for that kind of inner wisdom and uh, courage to expand the customary conventional thinking. Narottama Das Thakura um, did his preaching mainly through, through Kirtan, and he wrote two books, Prarthana and Prema Bhakti Chandrika, that contain his prayers and song. And um, I will end today by reading one of his songs. It would be wonderful to sing together, but unfortunately the technicalities uh, don't support it very well. So I will just read it. And actually I will uh, post it in the chat here at Zoom, so it is easier to follow it. Just the moment I'm looking for it. Oh Radha and Krishna, this person presents an appeal before you. You are both very charming and full of nectar, and your hearts are full of compassion. My lords, please listen to my request. O oh, dark complexant Krishna, O oh, moon of Gokula, O oh, lover of the gopis, O oh, golden complexant Radha, O oh, crest jewel of the gopis who are so dear to Krishna, when I hear the glories of your transcendental virtues, my heart becomes pacified. Hearing from the devotees' mouths that you are very merciful to the fallen and miserable, I joyfully take shelter of you. 
If you neglect me, I have no place to go. O Radha, all glories to you. O Krishna, all glories to you. O Radha and Krishna, all glories to you. O Krishna, O Krishna, all glories to you. O Radha, all glories to you. Narottamadas places his folded hands upon his head and falls to the ground before you. Please fulfill the desires of his heart. Please fulfill the desires of my heart. Okay, I think we can stop here for today. I would love to hear some of your thoughts and experiences about Saranagati, self-surrender and uh, humility. And I would love to hear if uh, Srila Narottama Das Thakur has inspired you, for example, by his songs or, or his life. So please share your inspiration as uh, encouragement for the rest of us. And uh, if there are any questions or comments, I'm happy to hear them. And please make sure that you are on the English channel before opening your mic. I think Sakirati and Siamananda raised their hand first, so please go ahead. Thank you for this uh, series. Uh, it was very nice and inspiring and um, I'm happy to hear about this connection you made uh, between Bhaktivin and Thakur and Srila Shidamaraj, both turning around the, uh, well, in the case of Srila Shidamaraj, it was the, the Nava Lakshan Bhakti, and in, in case of Bhaktivin Thakur, it was the six limbs of Sharanagati, I suppose. And, um, and yes, uh, but Narutam does talk or Sakirati will have to say something. <laughs> <laughs> He's pushing me on the stage. <laughs> yeah, first of all, I really, really, really love your series. Like how you structure everything and the way you talk, it's very clear and there are stories. There is just beautiful. All your classes were very beautiful. Thank you for this. And um, yeah, I actually, always felt very much attracted to Narutam Dastakur. So I went to visit his birthplace in Bangladesh and, uh, and it was an extraordinary experience, very, very beautiful. And um, yeah, that's it. I saw the Padma River and the tree where Mahaprabhu appeared in Narutam Dastakur. Uh, meditation and uh, it was very beautiful and I'm grateful for that. <laughs> there I also want to comment that it was, it was nice the connection you made between uh, like how Guru Maharaj speaks about Mahaprabhu giving away the gift to uh, giving away the prema to not be caught and you connected mm -hmm. that with the story of him leaving some some of it there for Narutam Das Thakur. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Sakrati, for sharing that story. I, I haven't, um, I have never visited that part of India or, or like um, been there, but now that uh, Bangladesh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So um, when, when I hear you telling about it, I can almost see it bef before my eyes and uh, it, uh, uh, it makes me inspired to perhaps visit there someday, hopefully together with, uh, with uh, devotees. But yeah, thank you for your comments. And um, I think uh, Sara Krahi or perhaps Priku is also having a comment. Thank you, Hari Priya. Thank you very much for this this series from our part as well. Uh, I missed the first two parts I mentioned last time, but I went back now afterwards uh, during this week or, or last week and listened to the first parts as well, and I loved them so much. This has been a completely excellent series in, in so many different ways, from how you have 
planned and structured everything to to your super sweet way of of presenting everything. So I'm I'm very very thankful to to you for this series. But I also have a question. Uh, it's connected with uh, uh, the first lecture lecture where you spoke about Saint Augustine and how how he uh, saw faith as a conscious decision that I'm deciding to believe. Uh, and how, how, how do you how would you reconcile this with this idea of, of of faith being a gift, which is then so kind of dramatically illustrated in the story of Narottam Das Thakur that you told us today? Uh, how can you give something like love, like uh, let leaving out all the kind of magical things of leaving love in a river and like that. But how is love something that you can kind of give to somebody else? Like, like you'd give a, a piece of gold or something. If, if love, if faith is, is a decision, a conscious decision on your own, how is it something that can be given? That's my question. Thank you for the question. I will say a couple of things that come to my mind, and then perhaps we can have a, a like discussion. I'm, I'm happy to hear what others here at Zoom are thinking about in relation to Prikupada's question. So um, how I'm, I'm seeing this, uh, I don't actually see like a big contradiction there, like um, like the way way how I, I'm seeing it is that um, well well for me for, for me the faith and love they they are presents from God. Uh, it's not something that comes from me me as uh, like like that. But I I have a choice. Like I can accept the gift or I can refuse to have it. So, so that's that's the part of my free will, how how I'm I'm able to approach, and then perhaps uh, the other way of looking it uh, is that um, um, in the very beginning of our path, uh, we might um, need uh, a little bit different kind of uh, like mental approach to things uh, that are sometimes so mystic and uh, perhaps not at all underst understandable for our rational mind. Uh, like, um, like, for example, personally, sometimes when I have been made perhaps a little bit struggling with my faith, and uh, it seems to me that all others they are having such deep religious and spiritual feelings and i'm the only one who is kind of like uh, having very dry mind and i'm not really really feeling anything <laughs> so at those kind of moments uh, i have felt the uh, kind of com comfort in um, in thinking in a way like um, like saint augustine was preaching like uh, faith is a conscious choice so like um, like even even though I'm not feeling this great this great love and uh, I'm not even feeling the potential of love that theoretically and according to my teachers and according to scriptures in growing in me, still still I can make the like conscious choice in my mind to follow my teachers and uh, look through the window of opportunity that they have opened opened to me. But uh, this is a couple of small talks. I'm very sure that Prikupad, you might have something to add to this. And also, if there's anyone on the call who, who would like to comment and add this question, please feel free to do so. I'm not hearing anything. I'm well, but there's um, um, other, there's some comment or question in the chat in Spanish. So uh, could you, Kaliuka Bavana, translate that?
Hey, thank you so much. Uh, this is really good question, and I will repeat it. So, Govinda Mohini is asking how to identify the false humility that can develop uh, when um, one is desiring uh, to be humble. <laughs> and um, um, I don't know. <laughs> It, uh, it, it sounds um, um, like we talked today, humility is not, uh, is not an easy exercise and not an easy ideal to, to read. And uh, I, I guess one of the points connected to, is, uh, connected to this uh, is uh, just to be very conscious like where we are and uh, and and what is our goal and the, um, the our ideal to which we are reaching and uh, kind of honestly um, evaluate uh, are the things that we are doing really connecting us more and more into this uh, source of love god and, uh, and whether our practice really is uh, softening our heart, like, uh, like my Guru Maharaj al always uh, like often or often uh, advises us to do, to use our head to soften our heart. And then I'm always wondering that, wow, that sounds so beautiful, but how, how can you do that? How am I able to do that? So, um, so how to identify the false humility? Um, just, just uh, yeah, I guess we just need to be honest with ourselves and uh, it's not always easy to see, like, like it's al always said that we can, al we can also become proud about things that we do, do on, the, on our spiritual path and, um, and uh, so I don't really have a, like a, a definite answer to this question. I know that sometimes our friends on the path they they help us if we start um, um, if we start becoming um, um, like too much att attached to false uh, humility. They they will remind us and uh, show us that we are not <laughs> we are we are perhaps a little bit uh, off the road if, if if I can say so. So that's also uh, like. Um, something to be grateful for, for our friends that they are watching our, ba our back. Thank you. Can I, can I say something, Haripriya? Of course, of course. Thank you. I just came to think of, of something that maybe relevant for this question. Uh, Guru Maharaj sometimes says that according to Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, humility is the absence of the enjoying spirit. And, uh, and uh, to me, that means that false humility maybe is the kind of humility that makes you, uh, it may look like humility, but it's actually, uh, diminishing your possibility to serve so okay. so so and, and instead instead kind of enjoying that that yes uh, i'm i'm so low i will not be able to do this because uh, i'm so disqualified uh, so so uh, real humility is something that that uh, will be be uh, fostering our service attitude instead that that may be perhaps relevant to, to this question. Thank you. That was really a beautiful way of stating it. Thank you so much. And Omkara, you have uh, also a comment or something that you would like to share. Please go ahead. Yeah, Haribo, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, for me, I think it's about um, realizing that real humility is a very high thing that's only going to emerge at a very high stage. So to me, it's helping to know that everything else before that is not real humility. 
and to be humble about not actually having real humility like i don't actually have real prem i just have a shadow of it so <laughs> keeps me humble about not having humility that's real humility kind of put it in contrast i don't know if that helps anything but that's kind of like uh, i know i have lots of insecurity issues so i like to think that i'm humble oh finnish people are very humble but i think it's just because we've been raised really badly about not ever taking like brigobat said in one of his classes that that we're just never wanting to be uh seen as as arrogant or that we are too pompous or something like this referring to to detecting something in our gurumarash for instance he's very confident and uh that can come across as somebody being arrogant or being uh i can't remember the word he used but but uh actually he is very humble he just knows uh things and he's not hesitant on letting others know that when he knows them so yeah i don't know if that helps that came to my mind thank you for your classes i really as well i'm chiming in on on very much enjoying your presentation and uh and your wisdom and your your uh little um analogs and and things to you so that's very helpful i'm probably gonna rewatch the whole series <laughs> soon so Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna and thank you for your comment i relate to a lot of what you said in the beginning about like insecurities and uh and also like understanding how 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 um high ideal the real humility is so thank you thank you for your comment and uh thank you for all the comments i i have really enjoyed today this like discussion and sharing your your uh, personal stories and uh, thoughts so i i find i i feel like i have received a special present here at the end of the talk now i don't see any more comments so um, thank you for your presence today thank you for your comments and questions and thank you for the spanish translation kaliuka pavana prabhu the series exploring the land of faith will end here but our expedition it uh, itself doesn't end i feel i feel grateful and uh, i feel blessed that uh, i have been able to share a little part of the journey with you i got a lot of inspiration uh, from your presence especially uh, from all of you who are here at zoom uh, so if there was a little bit of something in these talks that encouraged and uh, inspired you on your personal spiritual path, please consider it as a blessing from my spiritual teachers. And please don't blame them for, for my shortcomings and mistakes, for those I'm responsible myself. There are many great lectures coming up in November. At the same time, on Mondays, Chittahari Prabhu will, will be speaking with the topic, um, the glories of Sri Radha Chai. I'm looking forward to hearing those talks and hope to see you there. And there are also other beautiful talks coming up in November. I offer my gratitude and my hope to grow in humility at the feet of my spiritual teachers and at the feet of the Vaishnavs who are like wishful filling trees, full of kindness and compassion for all living beings. Sri Gaudiya Vaishnava Guru Parambara Ki Jai, Sri Lanarottamadas Thakur Ki Jai, Kauranityananda ki chai, pakti devi ki chai, koura pakta vrinda ki chai, koura premanande, hari bol. Slimati hari priyadasi ki chai. Chai.